welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two cousins, oh, that was so much louder than I wanted to be, who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Monica. And hold on, let me finish pouring my wine. It was just really loud. <laughs> we got Half Awake Boo to join us today on the podcast. You know, I am, um, I just don't know how to do this podcast without wine. I think it's become my signature look. Oh, definitely, for sure. And when I turn 21, I'll be joining you, and I cannot wait. Yeah, it's going to be great. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a time and a half. It's a really far t- way away, though. You're such a child. It's a year away. Yeah. That's like a whole, What's, that's like the rest of Hemlock Grove and probably another show. Geez. That's a Damn. long time. <laughs> <laughs> the first podcast episode where I'm 21, we br- we're both drinking on it. I don't care what we're talking about. Yeah. I'll cry. I'm like, it's a rite of passage. How has your week been, as if we haven't been talking for the last hour and a half? Um, it's been pretty all right. Pretty good. Uh, uh, I uh, had some turkey, obviously, for Thanksgiving. And then I, ha- I went into a turkey coma the day after. Um, and what else did I do? I saw my boyfriend yesterday, which was so much fun. I watched Fan of the Opera and cried. Um, you know, just girly things, just normal things that people do. Um, so yeah, much fun. I had a great week. I'm so exhausted because I cried last night, like right before I went to bed because Ooh, of watching. That's, that's the best. Yeah, it gives uh-huh. you the best. But like having to wake up, like it hurts my head. Like I could have woken up at like noon, and my head would still be fucking pounding. I um, I went back to work. I got violently ill. Um, I did not have Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, I ate dinner on the day that was Thanksgiving, but it was not Thanksgiving dinner. It was a wheel of cheese while sitting in my bed waiting for my parents to call me. Um, That sounds so much more pathetic than it really was. I was very happily laying in my bed watching YouTube videos while eating said cheese, but that made me sound really depressing. Well, were you watching, were you catching up on Jenna Marbles? No, what was I watching? Um, I don't remember what I was, oh, wait, I wasn't watching YouTube videos. I was watching The Bachelorette. There you go, that sounds very accurate. Also, speaking of The Bachelorette, Dr. Joe should not have gone home. That man is a gift. I don't know if the people that are listening to this podcast are also watching The Bachelorette. Courtney is. Courtney, you know what I'm saying. Dr. Joe was a gift. Oh, there you go, Courtney. Courtney, I don't actually think she watches The Bachelorette. We usually watch the same shows, but I don't remember if she watches The Bachelorette or not. Well, if she you probably... watch The Bachelorette and you're here, you're Mary Kay. I feel like if you don't watch The Bachelorette, but you just go on Twitter and know anyone on Twitter who watches The Bachelorette, you will know that Dr. Joe was a gift that we all did not deserve. That's fair. Love that for you. <laughs> he was... He was... Uh, He's an Asian anesthesiologist who was not problematic and not aggressive. They had a date where they were supposed to um, wrestle and like shit talk each other. And his shit talking was, I think you're really nice, okay? Damn. It's like, I don't really, I don't really want to hit you. I think you're a really nice guy. (laughs) It was a gift. A gift. Um, And what was I going to say? So when you come home from uh, Thailand, 
we'll have a Thanksgiving dinner, and our Thanksgiving dinner will include uh, crab rangoons, and that's it. That's not Thanksgiving dinner, that's every day. Okay. Also, my dad today was making me real hungry because he was like, can you just come home and start telling me all the Korean food he wants to make that he can't make because nobody else in the house will eat it? And I was telling him about, and then he goes, do you know how to cook Thai food yet? I said, no. He said, you should learn. I go, like, I don't eat any of it. <laughs> And he was like, what do you mean you don't eat it? I go, I mean, like, I eat Thai food. I'm in Thailand, but traditional Thai dishes, the ones you're trying to get me to buy, oh, cook, all have chili peppers or coconut in them. And I don't eat either of those things. Yeah, that's very so... fair. Very fair. I like coconut. Coconut's good. I chose My to move dog to a... so lovely. I chose to move to a country where the two most important uh, ingredients in all of their food are things that I do not eat. Where I um, get sun blisters just by existing. And um, I cannot speak the language to save my life. So, although I can speak the language much better than a lot of my friends, but it was still, it was a choice that I made. Yep. You know, I give you a lot of effort for doing it. I could have moved to Germany. They eat a lot of potatoes and it's cold and I speak German. But I, I did it. I moved to Thailand. It's true. You did do that. That's a decision you did make. <laughs> well, on that note, I didn't write down the uh, the title of this episode because it was so it abnormally was hella long and i don't understand like it didn't have anything to do with the episode no because i thought it would have been like oh like this is obviously going to be a book or a, a thing or a vision that peter has specifically about this one very important like, item if you are going to name the episode something this long it should make sense mm -hmm. but um i did write it down and this is um Hemlock Grove, season two, episode five, in call, um, which is called Hemlock Diego's Policy Player's Dream Book. Yep. I'm sorry. What? Who is Hemlock Diego? <laughs> what is a policy player? Where is this dream book? I understand none of these things. I thought that this would have been like something in a vision, like before I watched the episode, I wasn't like upset about it because I was like, oh, it'll probably be in a vision that Peter has and it's going to be like this important book that's going to have to deal with this cult. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, before the episode, I had no problem with the title because even though it was long, my only problem was, man, that's going to be really hard to put in the title card for the podcast. Yeah. But, um... Now, I have thoughts and questions. Yeah, because this episode had nothing to do with Hemlock Diego or his player's guide for a handbook, whatever dream book crap that was. And I don't care to remember it because it had nothing to do with this episode. Um, it premiered on July 11th, 2014. And it had a 7.7 .7 star rating on IMDb, which is the highest episode so far this season, which I disagree with. It's not a bad episode. I just would not call it. There was some really great stuff in this episode. Yeah. yeah. But remember how last week we said, if we don't learn anything new about the cult, you're going to have a very unhappy MK on your hands. We didn't learn anything new about the cult. No. Yeah. And then we got this title of the show, like this episode, and I'm like, cool, we're finally going to get something on this cult. Right. No. We had one scene that dealt with the cult. One. Oh, no. But I will say, there was... It felt a lot more cohesive, mm -hmm. and I think part of that is that there wasn't a lot of cult scenes. 
There was no scenes with Beaumont and the drug dealers. Like everything mm -hmm. in this episode was very focused on our main characters. Like it was all Olivia, Roman, and Peter centered. Everything mm -hmm. that happened was central to those three characters. And I think that's why I still liked the episode, even though I don't like where we are in the season. That's completely that's fine. fine. Fair to say. Um, for this episode, oh, well, like there was even some, there was one kind of comical scene um, that happens in this episode where I, it wasn't so much funny in the aspect of it, it was just funny for the character to be doing this. Um, actually, let me see. One, two, three. I wrote, like, physically wrote the words, ha, 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 three different times. Yeah. yeah. Like, there were like, funny moments throughout the episode. Like, I literally have a, um, a here that says, um, did we start watching a sitcom all of a sudden? Like, because I feel like we're going to see. Well, and here, here is, um, well, I think I know why some of the funny it was more funny than we're used to. And let me get into our creative team. So it was directed by, who I'm not gonna say this right, Sana Hamri, it's S-A-N-A-A, -A -A. I believe that's Sana, but I apologize if it's not. Um, she, she's kind of a badass actually. She was born in Morocco um, and her dad was Muslim, but her mom was Jewish. And she like went at one point in her high school, she was literally the only girl at the entire school. Really? really? Yeah. But um, once again, her, um, her directing path makes absolutely no sense as to how she got to Hemlock Grove. Um, we have another person who started out doing only music videos and she did like, Mariah Carey, Destiny's Child, Kelly Rowland, Common, like those music, kind of music videos. And then in TV, she directed some gems, like genuine gems, but very, very far removed content wise from where we're at. Um, she was a director on Desperate Housewives, uh, 90210, Nashville, Glee, um, Love Struck the Musical, and she directed Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, too. Wow. So, like, I'm very confused as to how Hemlock Grove fits into that collection. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here we are. Um, and then our writer, um, his name is Charles H. I want to say Egley, E G L E E. Um, and he um, wrote for shows like uh, Murder One, um, which was a show about serial killer, but um, he wrote a bunch of NYPD Blue, which, fun fact about me and the weird TV shows I watch, I put NYPD Blue in like my top five shows I've ever watched. I freaking love it. It's a early, like it's from the 90s. It's a cop drama, but it is got some of the funniest dialogue ever. Um, he created, he was a co-creator of the show Dark Angel with Jessica Alba, which did not last very long, but was very, very good. Um, he was part of the season one writing team that adapted The Walking Dead from a comic into a TV show. Um, he wrote for Dexter, he wrote for The Shield, and he's currently the showrunner, which means, and I only know what a showrunner is because of Doctor Who, but a showrunner is basically the producer who is in creative control. So like the buck stops mm -hmm. with them. Cause there's obviously all shows have like an F ton of producers. 
but like so like with Grey's Anatomy right now the showrunner is Chris um Krista Vernoff so she's the producer who is in charge of creatively like this is where the story is going right now the showrunner of Doctor Who is Chris Chibnall he is currently the showrunner of season three of American Gods so he definitely has the track record for comedy in dark situations yeah yeah so when I was looking at his credits I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy the writing this episode for sure like the the dialogue is going to be top-notch and it was it definitely was so in the beginning of this episode with the cold open oh, um the blurb yet. oh we didn't get to the blurb yeah. um the blurb doesn't make sense I mean it does make sense but last week the blurb was so spot on this week it was back to being shit. Um, <laughs> Miranda and Roman seek medical advice. Peter and Destiny must find a new way of helping Linda when her attorney informs them the case is hopeless. That is all you're giving me? Yep. Yes. And, and that's not that's even full. Uh, uh. It was just horrible. At least on um, Wikipedia, it is, even the Wikipedia blurb is better. Wow, that's oh. sweet. <sighs> yeah, the Wikipedia blurb says, just kidding, I'm not going to read it because it is way more spoilery than the Netflix blurb. Yeah. 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 That's probably why. But I mean, like, the IMDb blurb says Olivia gets bad news. That should be in this blurb. That was the best part of this episode. Honestly, one hundred percent. Like it, it, it is. Right now, as of no, watch it. I don't know. Who is talking about the show instead of watch it? Um, the bad news that Olivia has is bad for her but it's horrible for us to see and not in a narcissistic or an asshole way because we're just like oh we want to see olivia suffer it's because of who she is becoming right now that i love yeah love but also if you haven't watched the episode yet and you care about spoilers why the fuck are you watching this podcast very true because we we, I mean, the thing is, it'd be one thing if you, like, you can either watch the episode and then watch the podcast, or watch the podcast and never watch the TV show and just use this as your only foray into the show. But if you listen to this and then go, damn it, I didn't know that was going to happen. I'm so sorry, but this is not the place for you. Yeah. 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 And also, I don't know why sit and want to watch Mary Mary Kate speak when you can watch uh, Bill Skarsgård perform on a screen. Um, Am I wrong? No. We had some weird, weird visual moments in this episode. Like there was one scene where his hands just looked too big for his body. I was really uncomfortable with it. Thank you. Um, the unfortunate thing is what scene that was and where his hand was when it was looking too big made me really uncomfortable. Oh, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Because I thought his hand in that scene was going to a different area. It, because was, it was too big. Like, it just, his hand was, it was too big. Well, let's um, talk about the cold opener because there's another thing that's a little too big in the scene that I kind of fucking laughed at. Um, yeah, I said Pennywise before Pennywise. Great Pennywise. Okay, okay. So the show opens with uh, Roman sticking his face in a fridge to suck on some raw sausages because, you know, that's how he eats now. Um, 
And uh, Miranda comes into the kitchen and he's like, hey, you want some sausage? And she goes, no, I'm vegan. Since when? <laughs> like, literally. Did they not have chicken in the episode where he cooked dinner for her? I think so. I'm trying to go back. I, and also, I literally wrote, um, but last week she was going to eat his cock oval. She ate it this way. Nah, fam. She's not a vegan. Oh. <laughs> Trash. <laughs> it was there and I had to take it. I the bait was so it was easy hanging fruit Mary Kate. <laughs> the funny thing is when that happens later, I had the same thought that that joke was. <laughs> but um yeah so i don't know when she became vegan since between two episodes ago and now but apparently she has been since she was 15 even though that does not check out no so um and then he's we're and I, I, I was i had a stroke sorry when we were first watching the scene i was sitting there thinking i'm like they're she's acting pretty nonchalant for having some random baby just feeding on her like what and then you know she starts to ask about it and then they're t well she's talking about it while roman's like looking at her neck like like about to munch on it and then he does he's just like pennywise mouth jaw agape yeah it mouth was and um i wrote Nice going, Roman. And then I wrote, no, this is a yeah. dream. It's a, there was too much blood. Too much yeah. blood to have been real. Yeah. Uh, and she was also still way too alive for that amount of blood coming out of her body the way that it was. Like, at first, I was like, it could have just been really bloody. But I, I figured out it was a dream. And then as soon as I figured out it was a dream, it just, like, her throat, like, started like water falling blood and he was like dancing in it almost and I was like this is a yep. dream. Yeah. And it was more of like a hallucination that he was having because we snapped back to reality and she's like, bro, did you hear a single thing that I said? And he's like, Yeah, you're vegan. And my note says, ha, 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 I'm dead. And she was asking him all these questions. She's like, whose baby is it? Why is it feeding on me? What is going on? And he's like, Yeah. You're a vegan. <laughs> I think it immediately went to the cold, like to the, the theme. Like it was straight like sitcom, like joke theme song. It was ridiculous. I was like, what? And because it just seems so out of character for Roman to just be like, here's a funny thing that he says right now that isn't ah shit. Like, he, okay, I was, I was dead. I was. Dad, he made me laugh so hard. And um, then we come back from the opening scene, it, it picks up from where we left off after Roman's cute little joke. And they start trying to talk about it. And he's like, she's like wondering about like where this baby's from. Before they talk about it, he is aggressively calling Oh, price. Right. And I only wrote a note about it because it was the most ridiculous voicemail. He was like, uh, Dr. Price, I need to talk to you. It's really important. It, it, to me, call me back immediately. It's important. Roman Godfrey. Like, as if he wasn't going to know who it was after, like, the eight. And I was like, he just, it sounded like he was, like, writing a letter. He was like, Roman Godfrey. And I was like, what the fuck was that? The reason why he had to put his name was because if you, before it, Price's voicemail it's like please leave a long descriptive voicemail as to why you need my services along with your name and like the time you called or some weird stuff like that and roman's over here panicking he's like I just call me back it's super important super important okay bye all right uh roman got free and then he hangs up he's like mm -hmm. he's spiraling because he, i think that little uh hallucination daydream he had about you know eating miranda really just took a hold of him yeah for sure. And um, then they have a little discussion about the baby, or she's like concerned about because she's like, she's like, I'm gonna die. And he's like, 
There is nothing fatal about breast milk. <laughs> and he's like, um, so he told, tells her, he's like, we'll have you go with, like, I'll h- h- hook you up with the doctor and, like, go and have the bill sent to me. And they're, like, fighting, like, an old, like, bickering, like, an old married couple. I'm like, they act like they've been together for years. But my like, problem with this scene is that Roman doesn't want anyone to know about what is going on in his house. He clearly mm-hmm. works for a medical facility. Mm-hmm. And he sent her to the townie doctor. It yep. doesn't make sense to me. I think it was more so for her sake of mind because of the fact that he would have owned that. And if she wants to know, like, unbiasedly that... I feel like it could have been because, like, if he... Yeah, was, like, and I get, th- I get that he's trying to, like, make her feel like a normal person. But that... That is a mistake Olivia would not have made. Yes, for sure. And, um, I mean, like, it kind of backfires, but not really, because, like... I think it's going to be a problem. I think it's going to be a big problem. Yeah, and I think it might happen in passing with probably Olivia, but also Olivia does know that the baby is already alive. Oh, no. I think it's, I think it, that guy was way too talkative. He is, he's a gossip. There, I, that's going to happen. Because he was talking about a woman's, like, like, later on that scene happens, he's talking about a woman's appendicitis, and he's like, well, you need to have an appendix to have appendicitis, yeah. and he's having it in, on the phone while Miranda's in the room with him, so, like, HIPAA law is very loose to him. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we can get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Um, then we go to prison. Yep, yep, we do, from last week. And um, Michael is coming to Peter, and he's like, uh, they said you needed to talk to me. And Peter's describing the dream that he had. He's like, there's a boy in the water, like the Nirvana album cover, and a German shepherd, and somebody's going to die. And um, Michael goes, yeah, and I just bought a unicorn from the planet Zorkon. <laughs> And, like, they were, like, and, um, Michael's, like, unfortunately, I can't hold you here because the people are gone and no one's pressing charges, so I'll let you go, but, like, whatever drugs you're on, you need to stop or you'll be back here. But I, even in that moment, think that Michael knows something's up, like, with Peter, that he's not just fucking around. Yeah, I think he knows for the pure fact that he since he is with the order of the dragon he has to be aware of why shastor was there last season and that was for peter so for him to not know that peter probably has some ability because of the fact that he is a wolf because i think that that is something that he would know yeah but even if he's not sure about peter being a werewolf he doesn't know details it's not like he is unaware of supernatural existence Exactly. So I, I think that he does kind of have an inkling that this is not a And I, I hope Michael makes up for where Shastor went wrong in last, like, uh, Clementine went wrong last season because I think Michael has a purpose, more of a purpose than Clementine did here um, because it's not like, because Michael's objective isn't peter whereas i also think that we find out a little bit more about michael's past later in the episode and i think that michael is more likely to actually try to do the right thing yes and to actually try to solve the murders and to not just because like Chasser or Clementine didn't really care. Like she cared, but she didn't really care about the girls dying. She just needed to stop Peter. I think the fact that there are children dying genuinely bothers Michael. Yes. So I think that is the big difference there. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we go to uh, the care facility. Which I had my head down because I was writing a note and I realized 
I know the show too well because I knew it was Olivia's theme music that was playing. The same music plays every time we first see her in an episode. And I wasn't even looking at the screen and I wrote Olivia as my next note because I recognized the music. I hate that. I love it, but oh, hate it. Um, so in this, uh, in the beginning of the scene, uh, Price is uh, doing first, his- First, Olivia is shaving her legs by the bathtub and she cuts her leg and it doesn't immediately heal. Yes. Yeah. And so Price is giving her um, her exam and he's like checking her tongue and stuff like this is one of my favorite lines. He's, she's like, do you just pee with excitement whenever you use a scalpel? And, um, <laughs> and I pride myself on my bladder control. <laughs> like their back and forth was honestly. Like the dialogue this episode was amazing. Impact. Honestly. Ball. Like the dialogue between both of the ca- like every character with anyone they interacted with was so so good, and like but because it's so good, it felt also so out of character for them. Right. It was like, it was like so, what happens when this is what would happen if someone who knew how to write was writing the show the whole time. And the thing that I think is amazing about it is like because I feel like the characters are more human. Like, there are things that they would actually experience and feel in these certain times, and um, like, there's going to be a there scene... There was only one scene that I didn't particularly like the dialogue, but I understood the choice. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about it when I, we get there, but um... Yeah. Um, basically... So they're cracking jokes back and forth at each other. And um, Johan sees the cut on Olivia's leg. And she's like, don't worry, it'll heal. And he's like, it's fine. You're due for a blood test anyway. So he's going to like check to see why she's not um, healing. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a note about this later. But this is the first time. And I'm going to talk about it later when we get there. But Johan knows a fuck ton about what being an upir is. Yeah. Yeah. Still more than me, because I still don't really know what it is or understand it. But he knows a lot, which makes me feel like Olivia was not his first involvement with this. Yes. Yes. Or... No. Yeah. I'm going to say that there's a possibility that he could be as well. I, I had that thought too, but later on in the scene when we see how Roman interacts with Price, I don't think he is. I still don't know. Because we've never, we've still, like, if he is, he has a intensely cultivated sense of self-control. He is even more in control than Olivia. Yeah. So I don't know. Longer than Olivia would. Right. So I, I still don't. I'm, but I had that thought as well. I did my, have a theory that maybe he is more than we know. Mm-hmm. Um, so after this, we see Shelly in her little bunker with her little friend who comes to visit her, and he brought a phone. He's like, we can play games on it. It's mom and dad's. And she so takes she out the phone. takes it and signs into her email and sees the millions of messages that Norman has been leaving her, um, which... Um, Jason is not happy. He's like, are we going to play the game or not? He's like, okay, Jason, calm down. She's a fugitive who needs help. Yeah. But also, she can't talk, and he's a little kid, and she's not explaining to him why she took his phone and is not giving it back, so, like, I, I feel you, Jason. Yeah. But she replies to Norman's email, 
We don't see yet what she says, but she does reply. Yeah. Um, and then it goes to uh, Peter coming home from jail to from to Destiny's, and Destiny is like, "Where the hell were you? We're supposed to be at the lady lawyer fifteen minutes ago." I still have that like she doesn't have a name; it's just lady lawyer. Yeah, but my note for that scene was just Destiny is pissed, like she always, not having it. But then my next note is, oh, but Peter is more pissed because, um, so Destiny's yelling at him. Basically, he plugs his phone in because it's dead because he was in jail all night, but he leaves Roman a voicemail, or at least we assume it's Roman. He leaves a voicemail and it's like, I had another dream. We need to put our heads together. I'll call you later. So I would assume who else would he be calling about his dreams but Roman? Um, yeah. So, but then they get to the lady lawyers and the lady lawyer is like, listen, um, there's some more charges. Apparently your mom received stolen goods and they were expensive. They were uh, Louboutins. Is there like, is there any way you can prove that that's not true? And Destiny just goes, no, I, I wear the ones she gave me all the time. <laughs> so then the lawyer's like, at best, we're looking at 10 years in prison. So mm -hmm. Peter throws a rage fit and throws a chair and flips a bookshelf and starts yelling. And he's like, I know a scam when I see one. I'm a fucking gypsy for God's sake. And this is, and you're a rat. And he flips out. Yeah. It is, um, hashtag hella not cute. No, definitely not. Um, then we go, <laughs> Roman. We go to Roman in his office and his secretary is telling him all the meetings he has and he's like, did Price call? He's like, no, should I call him? But then there is a secret note on Roman's desk that says, S5 maintenance closet ASAP. So Roman goes down and my note says, that is one hella fast elevator. Yeah, I literally thought the same thing. I was like, I really do not like how fast the elevator is going down. No, there, that was no. Granted, like, so when I was in Taipei, I went to Taipei 101, which is one of the, I think it's in the top 10 tallest buildings in the world. And it also has one of the fastest elevators. Is it Taipei? Yeah, it is. Because when I went to Kuala Lumpur, I was with Brittany. So it wasn't that. Yeah, the elevator in Taipei 101 is incredibly fast. And it's like advertised as being very fast. And it was very disconcerting. And that elevator was moving faster than when I was in Taipei. And I was so uncomfortable. I was like, there's no way that that elevator moves that fast and is physically safe. I was yeah. so uncomfortable. And I know that's such a dumb thing to be worked up about but it made my stomach drop just thinking about moving that fast. Yep. So I'm like, it has to feel like you're falling at that point. Yeah. And also like, if you watch this show and don't expect me to get worked up about stupid things, like how fast the elevator is, I don't know what podcast you've watched for the last 20 weeks. Cause I get worked up about dumb shit. Yeah. So Roman goes after his um, hauntingly quick elevator ride down to the basement and goes into the maintenance closet and finds the secret door to the lab. And he sees the Ouroboros baby. That's not a baby anymore. And um, Is her name Priscilla or something. Priscilla. Yes, her name's Priscilla. Yeah, yeah. that's what I wrote down. I literally wrote down a note. I was like, who names their the first? like non-human conceived person, Priscilla. Priscilla, queen of the desert. I love that, but she's in water. Um, but do you know who Priscilla, queen of the desert, do you even know what that is? 
No, I, I'm, I don't. It's a music, movie musical about drag queens and a, and a transsexual. Or, at 1994, so it was still called transsexual at that time. But yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> transgender and drag queens on a road trip. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I highly, highly doubt that Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, is where they got that name from. The dance. <laughs> I mean, the who knows? They could have. It could have been I mean, that face mask. Uh, he might yeah. be. A queen. He might be a queen. He honestly might be. Um, and so while the um. While Price is introducing Norman, not Norman, Roman, to the Ouroboros baby, who is now a woman, um, he's like, oh, you might have, she's a lot different from the last time you saw her, but you wouldn't remember that. And and like, then, then I remembered that Price put him in a coma and I got real angry again. Yeah, I was like, way to go, Price. Um, and so then Price shows him, he's like, it's he's like, you're home now, like, it's time for me to show you, like, how to help. And so he shows him this room and he explains there's this big tank that looked like the Ouroboros tank, but it has like this like blood mixture thing that's meant for Oupiers to feed off of. And it's like 8,000 years of something that's like distilled in a way. No, no, no. It wasn't. That's not what he was saying about 8,000 years. He was saying that this is equivalent to the agricultural revolution of 8,000 years ago when it comes to Oupiers. He was saying the agricultural revolution that happened 8,000 years ago for like let human beings stop living only as hunter gatherers and begin to settle down into one place and like have farms and have homes. So this thing that he's invented, concocted, whatever, will allow Oupiers to settle and be normal and live in one place instead of hunting and gathering bodies. Yes. And um, so, but it was, um, hella nasty. Yeah. My notes literally say for this whole scene, hella nasty, WTF, and bomb city. That's all I wrote for the whole scene. I don't blame you because, like, even I was kind of grossed out because uh, Price goes and fills up a little cup with so much in it for um, Roman, and Roman's like, yes. So he just says, fuck it, lifts the vat. Like, first of all, Price st tries to stop him, and he, like, fucking tosses Price. He's like, no. And he goes, he's like, your metabolism isn't set for it yet. Like, you have to get used to it. And he's like, I don't care. And he just opens up the valve and just lets everything pour out. And he's just, like, stuffing his face. And then after, like, about a good minute and a half of him just, you know, going ham, he like is starting to look woozy and Price is like moving on over to him and he's just standing there watching him and like you good homie and then uh Roman just proceeds to what it was disgusting but yeah, like, in fact I wrote bomb city and then he immediately started to bomb and I was like see you and me both bro you and yeah, me both he looked like a jelly baby because like this stuff has like a jelly type of consistency to it and it was like all over his face and his hands and his arms and he just looked like a freshly jelly baby. It was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. Yeah, pretty pretty gross. I will say that. Pretty pretty gross. Like even the even the shower of blood that he took in the first scene did not freak me out as much as this. Yeah. It was just so bad. Um, um, then we, oh, wait, real quick, Roman freaks out and, like, storms out when Price is like, hey, like, it's okay. He, like, freaks out, gets up, and just storms out with, like, this sh just jelly shit. everywhere, yeah. Um, then we go to... Miranda's doctor appointment and um, um, the doctor is just like this adorable old man telling funny stories. He's like your stereotypical like small town doctor. Like he reminded me of like Everwood and Heart of Dixie like 
small town doctor. But he was also, as you would assume from small town doctor, like very gossipy. Like he was like, oh yeah, I guess you're lactating because you're like around a baby and everything like that makes like, and he was like, he just said every, everything that I said last episode about like why you could, that's what the doctor said. I'm a doctor now guys. Um, <laughs> but so then, but then I knew something was a little up because he was like, so you're staying with Roman Godfrey, like, and he started like making weird passive aggressive comments about how effed up the Godfrey family is. And like, of course, Roman doesn't talk about it. It's all weird. And I was like, yep. but the one thing that I do have to say, like he was, when he was talking about Roman, like he kind of gave Roman props for being as strong as he is for dealing with the bullshit. Oh yeah, no, like I liked the doctor, but he gave me that vibe of the person who's going to accidentally ruin everything. Yeah. Because yeah. he's just so normal compared to everyone else. And he doesn't know that he's going to ruin everything. Yeah. And uh, uh, I said, the only thing that I saw kind of off-putting, um, the doctor was very, like, he was very sweet, very nice. And I was like, but when Miranda was getting ready to leave and change, like, you can call me anytime you need anything, Okay. Then he says, yeah, like, he's like, seriously, like, I mean, call me anytime, day or night. And I'm like, kind of creepy. Just it was, know. like, borderline creepy, but it was also one of those things where, like, I think it feels creepy because we aren't from a community that's like that. Yes. If you lived in a small town where there was only one family doctor in the whole town and, like, you were an outsider who felt really awkward and they would be like, no, it doesn't matter what time you can call me anytime. Like she came in there because she was lactating, but also like she had whiplash that she never dealt with. Like he was trying to make sure that like she knew it's okay to go to the doctor. So like, yeah. I agree. It felt a little weird, but I also, I got it. I yeah. Got it. So that's completely fair. Cause, um, then after this scene, th we uh, they take us to Peter and Destiny going to see uh, Linda in prison. And they are, of course, fighting again. Yes. My heart actually, I'm so sad in this scene. Like, this episode made me very kind of sad for Peter. I felt so bad. Um, and I didn't feel bad yet. I feel bad later, but I didn't feel bad yet. This scene, I was like... Well, I felt bad because of the fact that like, when they all come in and then we f find out that like they're talking to uh, Linda and she has a black eye and she's like, oh, you should see the other three chicks. And it just makes me realize like how terrible like she is getting treated in there. And yeah. uh, then we also find out that she's getting transferred. She's getting transferred and she doesn't know where to. Yeah. Which is kind of messed up. Yeah. But I mean, not surprised because they're not genuinely nice to Linda in the prison anyway. And um, so when they find that out, like, um, she's like, but hey, you know, like, well, this is something that we'll get through. It's just like one step towards, you know, something else. And um, when they, uh, they, they leave the scene with like, kind of some sort of hopefulness for Linda where I'm like, I don't know how the hell they're gonna pull off everything they need to pull off for her. Um, and when we're left with that, we go back to Olivia in the, um, therapy center once again with Price visiting her to give her her, uh, blood work results. Her bad news. So, yes. he said, so I got some news for you. You are aging rapidly, like, rapidly. And she was like, oh, so what, I only have another few hundred years? And he goes, no, more like a normal human lifespan. And she was like, what, a human lifespan? That's like that. She's like, there's no, there's like barely a point in like being like, born. Actually, oh, it wasn't even a point in being born. It's more like, like damn, Olivia. Um, so my notice, Which, oh, oh, gee, Olivia's gonna die. Yeah, and honestly, Price gave us a very uh, uh, clear representation as to why Olivia's been so sympathetic and 
sensible and feeling and everything like that. Like she's and, basically a senile about to die old lady. Yeah, and I mean, she, <laughs> Olivia says something when she finds out that she is only has a human lifespan. She was creeping mother of Christ, and I was like, that is probably my new favorite saying. But this is when I finally just, like, got so fed up with, how does Johan know all of everything. this stuff? He knows everything. He's like, there haven't, he said, there's never been any scientific study on the effect of, um, of, of upir venom on another upir blood. Like, he was talking about, like, scientific studies and data about them. I said, who has a vampire database? Yeah, Price does. Apparently. Wow. And um, there is something there is something mad scotch going on with this man. Yes. And Price not, at, by the end of this episode, I fully think that he's on our side. Yeah. Like I I'm I I mean I could be wrong because every time I think that I know what his motivation is, something else happens. But I think that he is more team Godfrey than he is team Laud. Yeah. And um, I think, like, there was a, a saying that Price said when he was talking to Olivia, because Olivia was getting all emotional and, like, wanting to be there for Roman. He was like, why do you want to be there for him when he literally wants nothing to do for you? She's like, well, her, him and that baby are all I have left. And he goes, Olivia, compassion doesn't, doesn't look well on you. Yeah. And I was like, he said... What did he say? Oh man, I let me see if it's on the on, if, let me see if it's on the quotes for this page on IMDb because the, what he said to her about how he felt about her newfound emotions was just like so intensely like well written. Yeah. I'm so mad about how long this episode title was. Me too. I had to stretch my body. I look so homeless. I was excited to go back to sleep after this and to, then to eat all my Thanksgiving Day leftovers for the second day in a row. Ugh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, compassion doesn't suit you, Olivia. I miss that venomous disposition and the heart and that heart the size of a caraway seed. Yes. Ugh. You were like wrote in that <laughs> in that line. But also, okay, there are there are twelve quotes saved on this page, and I would just like to go through them all because I think they are all our favorite quotes. So there's that one. Olivia creeping mother of Christ. Olivia to Johan, clearly one of your lab retards made a mistake. Then there's this conversation. Are you telling me I only have a couple hundred years left? More like a normal human lifespan. A human lifespan's over like that, hardly worth going through the trouble of being born. Peter, I see what's gonna happen in dreams before it goes down. Michael, and I have a pet unicorn I bought um, on the planet uh, Zorknoid. Peter, see, I told you you weren't gonna believe it. Michael, and you knew that on account of being psychic? <laughs> Peter, I have not turned. Destiny, and you haven't been fooling with those dreams? Peter, on my gypsy's honor. Destiny, that's what worries me. <laughs> uh, Linda, how's the trip? How long's the trip to the next squirrel cage? Corrections guard, three and a half hours and no potty stops. Linda, you two won't mind driving with the windows, uh, the back with the windows down then, huh? <laughs> Linda, no wonder your hands are sticky the way you two jerk each other off. <laughs> uh, Roman, honey, I'm home. That's it. Yes. But that was, that scene was funny. Um, then there's the peeing with excitement line that we talked about. And then this one, this one is, it's Olivia's reaction that makes it good. Johan. I have the results of your blood test. These anomalies you've been exhibiting lately, normal human emotion, the diminishing rate of healing, consistent with a non upir metabolism. Olivia, ugh, hate it. <laughs> uh, this was a really good episode for writing. Yeah. Oh, so good. Um, 
So after we find out that Olivia, um, you know, like has all this stuff, there's there was a scene I think before I'm sorry I think before we went to Olivia where Destiny was making some form of soup type stuff, and then um, Andreas goes, "Is that where my shrooms went to?" She's like, "Let's all do a good cause," and then he's like, "I forgot what he said." Oh, and who are you trying to assassinate? And she's. She said, no, we're not assassinate, we're just, uh, justice, what was it, justice fighters? Or something like that? The freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. Um, and, and the next scene is, um, in Norman's office, and he's dealing with a patient, and the only reason this is important is because the patient is the author from last week who is not seven foot two. Really? Yeah. That was the author? Yeah, that's John, um, or David Paul Francis, who is not seven foot two. But also, he was so funny. He was like, he's like, my wife thinks I'm boring, but like, I'm really, I'm really not boring. I do crossword puzzles. I do archery. I made 20 ships in a bottle. If that's not not boring. And I was like... <laughs> And then that is me. That is me. Literally yeah. me. And the thing that I find really like the other funny part is like, so Norman gets the message from Shelly, and now we get to see what Shelly had said. And Shelly was like, I'm like fine, like thank you for like still believing in me and like trusting that I didn't do anything terrible like everyone else is saying. I can't come back, but just know that I love you and, like, I'm always thinking of you type of... Type yeah, of but basically, like, I can't take any more help from you. You've already done too much. Yes. And, and the, the whole time he's reading this letter and getting emotional, and the patient is still talking about, I cooked dinner last night, and it was meatloaf and peas, and my wife called that boring, too. If that's not the pot calling the kettle beige... <laughs> I, it was honestly, like, through all this, like, drama, like, there was some, like, good, funny moments, where I was like, this is actually entertaining. The funniest episode. Yeah. Of- no, 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 it- not may have. This is the funniest episode. The yes. Only, like, there have been other moments, like, I still think the serial killer, the school for serial killer conversation was my favorite conversation, but this has, hands down, the most comical moments of the whole show. Oh, for sure. And it only gets better. It literally only gets better when it comes to comical moments. Um, it's, I'm sorry, Mary Kate, I'm, all I'm gonna say this is no more whoop whoop. That's all I'm gonna say. That's the scene that I don't like the dialogue. Cause I, I don't either, but I'm, I was, I, I, this is supposed to be funny. <laughs> oh my God, no more whoop whoop. Please no more whoop whoop. I fucking lost it. Okay, we will get to the whoop whoop. But um, so then, then we get to uh, Linda being transferred, and that's when the conversation about uh, shitting in the back of the um, transfer uh, pan happens, and the, the correction guards are just like really assholes and they're like oh like our fingers are sticky there must be tree sap on this van or something and then they're just like talking shit and she says like no wonder your eyes are fingers are sticky the way you jerk each other off all the time like you guys are ridiculous and then all of a sudden they start to uh hallucinate spiders all over each other's faces and they're like freaking out but Linda can't see them, obviously, because she's not hallucinating, and she's like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like this, uh, the, the spiders. I hate spiders. Didn't, I, I felt like, it, after I was watching them, like, ew, like, I kept touching my face, because, like, I felt like there were some on my face. I'm like, ew, I hate it here. Spiders. <laughs> when I was, um, 14, I asked my mom if we could get a pet, and she said no, because she's alert, like, Everybody in my family is allergic to like dogs and cats. And I was like, but taran- you're not allergic to tarantulas. And she was like, absolutely not. And I still mad about it. Still want a tarantula. Good job, Ann Kay. You did the right thing. Still want a tarantula. Well, you'll have your own place one day and then you can have a tarantula. It's going to be such a weird place. It's going to have tarantulas and bearded dragons and. 
no man will ever want to come there. I don't have any of that, and it was very hard for me to get a man to come anywhere near me, so it's... I want a snake, too. I like snakes. I think snakes are cool. But yeah, so there's spiders. Um, so, after they, uh, break, they're breaking Olivia out, um, not Olivia, uh, Linda out, we go back to Olivia, sitting there watching the clock ticking, and reliving her conversation today with Price, and then we see her get up, and, uh, she changes into a really nice dress, and she goes to grab her cane, but then she leaves it there, and then we see her at a club, and she's, like, drinking, having a few shots, and then a guy comes up to her and he's like, oh, the gentleman over there um, wants to know if you'd like to join Wait, him. No, you missed a chunk. What? Because we, the guys hallucinated, but then after they hallucinated and they ran away from the truck, the actual prison breakout happens. Because my next note says, ugh, love a good prison breakout. Um, yeah. Andreas mm -hmm. and Destiny and Peter come to rescue Linda. Andreas has made Linda a fake passport okay. and they got her a plane ticket and they are getting her to Romania and uh so like good on them yeah love that for them. Um, and so yeah so like Olivia goes to this bar and um I they're having an open mic night and there's this girl who has to be tone deafer than shit singing at the present moment. What? Do you know what she's singing? Do you know what she's singing? A song that I sang to you three weeks ago that you acted like you didn't know was a real song. And I was like, yes! Because her karaoke song is Beautiful Dreamer. And I sang it to Monica after Roman named his horse that. And she stared at me like I was a crackhead. And I was like, no, Beautiful Dreamer, wake unto me. <laughs> yeah, but this girl was singing it, but not really. She was like, she sounds like know. that, only not on pitch. Even that good, yeah. Um, quite terrible. And then when she's done singing, people are cheering for some reason. Like she had just like performed the grand. She was a beautiful dreamer. Yes, R. she was beautiful. R.I.P. Beautiful dreamer. Um, and so then they're like, "Well, we have an open spot for uh, karaoke. You want to take it?" And I take it, and Olivia's just sitting there, and then we see a fucking snippet, and then it flashes to her standing on stage, and about to start singing. My notes are like, oh, I said, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up, no, oh my god, Olivia can sing. <laughs> oh yeah, she can sing. But she goes, there are, um, not a lot of things I haven't done in my life. This is one of them. So then she starts singing, and she sings, and I just saw the name of the song on the IMDb trivia page, because IMDb actually had trivia for the episode. I know, Mostly right? It was just the song. Um, but, so she's singing this song that my note is, that's um, one hell of a karaoke choice, because <laughs> it was not really a good song yeah it was very repetitive um i mean and the thing is funky jams can, can J funky jansen can sing and she sounded really really good but it just yeah. wasn't a song that showed off her yeah. ability to sing um the song she sings um is called Creature with the Atom Brain by Roki Erickson. And I've never heard of that song before until this episode. Um, I was like, it was like that, well, Mary-Kate, you haven't seen American Horror Story. And when Olivia got up to sing, I was just like, it was like an American Horror Story freak show when Elsa Mars started singing. 
and that was kind of that feeling that you have because it's such a it's drama uh, driven so to have moments like this are very strange and I was like yeah I remember when that season of American Horror Story like sold songs on iTunes because they sang full covers of songs on that show and I'm like I'm having that same moment I did when I first saw that season of American Horror Story I was like oh shit um, same kind of feeling. I honestly kind of like it. It's trippy, but I kind of liked it. Um, there was also apparently a film in 1955 called Creature with the Atom Brain. Um, um, Okay. Okay, also, Rocky Erickson's band, when he sang the song, was called Rocky Erickson and the Aliens. Oh, I love that. Um, and he also was in a um, band called the 13th Floor Elevators and was apparently a pioneer of the psychedelic rock genre. So if anybody really is into that, I apologize for not knowing anything about this. Um, but yeah, but the song was based on the 1955 horror movie called Creature with the Atom Brain, apparently. Oh, I love that. Um, but the lyrics are uh, pretty Very vampire-esque. Or yeah. where to ask. I don't know. It was just weird. Um, and after this lovely, charming scene that we see of Olivia uh, singing, um, we go back to Norman, and he's showing the private detect, uh, private investigator, um, the email from Shelley, and um, and they're talking like, well, we gotta convince her to turn herself in, and then Norman goes, well, have you gotten anything more on Marie? And the private investigator, she's saying, like, no, we haven't yet. Um, and then Norman's like, well, it's not like her to, like, up and leave. It doesn't seem like her. And um, then she goes, the private investigator goes, well, what's the last one? Like, have you talked to your girlfriend? Like, did, yeah. the, did you know that, like, Shastor went and talked to your girlfriend? And he's like, yeah, Olivia told me. Um, and he was like, you need to put, like, let me be in the room alone with her. And he was like, she's been through enough already. Like, leave her alone. And my only note about that scene, oh, and that's, and she also, in her deciding to look for Marie, she dug into Michael, and that's how he found out about his past and, like, his army career and everything, and that's why I think he's a, takes his responsibility a little more seriously. Um, but my note for that scene is that this lady is going to throw a wrench into things. I already don't like her. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's weird because, like, I mean, like, the possibility of that little boy that Shelly knows being one of those kids on that list of people that this cult is after, um, it's kind of shocking to see that Shelly's slowly coming back into contact with everyone. Um and I think, okay, no, I, I, I have a note for it. Okay. Um, so after we find out this whole deposition that happens, um, we go back to Roman coming home to Miranda. And that's when we get the, honey, I'm home. He's like, and the, it's kind of, it's cute because like they act like a married couple. I'm like, oh, they're aware of it. Cool. Yeah. Um. um and he asks about the doctor and she was like, turns out um, it's uh, not super normal, but also not fatal. And he goes, which is exactly what I said. And then he was like, yeah, that she was like, yeah, the doctor said it's probably just because of being around the baby. And he was like, you told the doctor about the baby. And he like freaks out a little bit. And that's when I was like, shit, like, yeah, the doctor's totally gonna tell somebody that's gonna happen. And yeah. Roman's like, freaks out and is like, I don't want, 
And he went, no, because like the baby's grandma, like there's abuse in the family. Like the baby's grandma is crazy. And I wrote, the grandma is in fact dangerous. That is, that is a fact. You are not yep. lying. And then she's like, is any of that even true? And then he uh, gets pretty honest for Roman. Mm -hmm. Like gets real deep. He's like, Listen, the baby's mine. It was an unplanned pregnancy. The mom died in childbirth. The crazy grandma who could hurt it is my mom. I don't, I want to be a dad, but I don't know how. Every time I go into the room, the baby screams at me. She's afraid of me and I'm afraid of her and I don't know what I'm doing. And then uh, Miranda says some really supportive stuff and she's like, you feel all this way about your child already. So like, Clearly the world's not as broken as you think it is. And so then he kisses her and then he pulls away and is kind of like, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. And then she says, come here, ice man. Which I don't understand, but, and then obviously Roman and Peter become Eskimo brothers again. Um, times two. Times two. The double Eskimo brother whammy. Two for two. They're, like, they're winning. And I wrote, uh, I called that too. Poor fucking Peter. Yeah, Peter literally is not winning any of his journeys <laughs> in this season. He's lost all of them. And, and this is the scene where I decided uh, Bill Skarsgård's hands are too big for his body. Yes. Mm -hmm. You want to know? Watch it for yourself. Um, because but I will say, I also had a weird thought during the scene because um, if you go back to our Halloween special, uh, Monica made a really funny comment about how in the movie Halloween, the sex scene was the least convincing sex scene ever. Their bodies were not moving in a way that could have actually been sex. And in um, this scene, they definitely were moving anatomically correctly. Yep. That's one thing that this show is. True to its sex scenes. 100%. In every single yeah. Um, Don't recommend watching the show with your parents, kids. Don't do that. And if you're a kid, I don't recommend watching the show. Yeah. Yes. Um, so after the guy that you are dating that you haven't had sex with that you're afraid to have sex with because there's a lot of sex and blood and just like don't do it. Yeah. Just don't watch the show with anyone. Watch or it by yourself. I don't it. watch the show. Yeah. Also, I'm going to say this because if you're watching this show, I've made this comparison before and no one's laughed at it when I know I'm correct. Because no one watches a lot of stuff that Bill Skarsgård's in that I personally know. But since we're dealing with the show that deals with Bill Skarsgård, I feel like I can make this assumption and, you know, state it for my fella, fellow girlies guys out there who agree with me um i think that bill skarsgård is the harry styles for girls that have daddy issues and a nicotine addiction and i am not wrong on that statement they have the same energy i know One a lot of girls who have nicotine addictions and daddy issues who also stand harry styles though oh i stand harry styles but guess what i also have that um, have you heard me talk about Bill Skarsgård? Yes. Um, also unrelated to Bill Skarsgård, but gen generally related to this topic, I've decided I'm going to make my own web series where I rank the 15 hottest guys in each Twilight movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> Charlie better be number one, or I will sue. He's, he's not. Who's number one, though? Watch my series. I'm not going to spoil the number one answer. Okay, give me a number 13 slot. Um, number 13. I've only made my list for the first Twilight movie so far. Um, and number 13 is... Uh, Oh shit. Turns out there's not actually as many guys in the first Twilight movie as I thought there was. Um, so when I was making this list, 
I believe number 13 is uh, Mr. Molina, the science teacher, because there's just that few guys in the movie. That is very true. That is very true. I think that's where we were at. I feel like James, I didn't say I didn't like James. He made me uncomfortable. Oh my God, James is so hot. James is in the top five. That's a lie. No, it's not. Jasper better be in top five. <laughs> Jasper's number one. Did you see the way he swung that baseball bat? Let's be real. Fair. Very um, obviously, Jasper, Edward, James, Emmett. Oh, well, yes, Emmett, but I would put Emmett before James. Um, and then Eric, just because I, I love me a Twinkie Asian boy. Yes. Then, then there's Mike. No, Mike is. Oh, wow. No, no, no. Yeah. So then, so then, then there's Laurent, mm -hmm. Charlie. Where are we at? Where's Carlisle's not higher up on the list? Not in the first movie because that wig that they gave him in the first movie was tragic, and it made him look so fake. That's fair. So. Jacob, because even with the long hair, he's still a babe. Carlisle, then Mike. So Mike is number 10. Then 11 is Tyler, because they did him dirty by giving him no personality in the movie. 12 is Billy Black, because he's still a good looking dude. 13. Mr. Molina, because we're running out of dudes in the movie. 14, Waylon, because again, we have run out of dudes in the movie. And 15, that guy at the restaurant who was thinking about cats while uh, Edward was reading Minds. Because. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The dude who was thinking about cats. <laughs> We ran out of all the men. That is the top 15 hottest guys in the first Twilight movie. When I start watching uh, New Moon every day for two weeks, I will rank them and give you guys that answer as well. Can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This is fun. Um, By the last movie, it'll be a way better list because once you have all the vampires involved, there you get some hotties and stuff and it's better. God. It will be so hard to put, like, because Garrett's one of my favorite characters that comes in. He better be able to move up to your top five. Well, okay, in this one, so of the people that are in my top 15, um, two of them you'll never see again, and two of them are dead. So that automatically already knocks you down to only nine possible guys yeah. to be carried over. So... And but, I can't add 15 minus four is 11, not nine. Yeah, you tried. You tried, it's okay. And but, uh, that's how I get away from talking about Bill Skarsgård's sex scene by awkwardly ranking Twilight Men. Um, next, we go to the airport. Where we're saying goodbye to Linda and they're sending her off to Romania. And it looks like she's a little scared to go start off this life because she doesn't know a lot about the Romanian culture. Like, she knows a lot about the Romanian culture, doesn't know, like, how to speak it. Doesn't she doesn't feel like know she any people. She doesn't know, have any know the language. She's very nervous. And Peter's like, listen, I'll get a fake passport and I'll come live with you too. And she's like, no. I don't know how I know, but I know that Hemlock Grove still needs you. Like, the people need you. You have to be here. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very sad. Yeah. yeah. It's very sad to see mm -hmm. Linda go I'm scared that this might be the last that we're going to see of Linda for the rest of the season. I don't know what we're going to see. Her. I'm pretty sure, I don't know about series, but season, I'm like 97% sure she won't be back this season. Yeah. Um, then we go back to uh, Godfrey Institute, where Johan is being a straight uh -huh. savage. Not yet. Oh, wait, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was thinking of the very end, the John yeah. Lennon's. This is when she is telling Dr. Chernobyl that she is a Bolshevik traitor war criminal that he's going to send to prison if she doesn't get the shit done that he needs her to get done. Yeah, he needs that blood clotting enzyme, pretty much. He's like, he's like, you want to go to jail? You want to go on trial for a war criminal? He, he called her a Bolshevik um, 
a nicer, I don't, I don't remember exactly the terminology he used, but basically he called her a Bolshevik piece of shit. Yeah, he called her a stool sample. A stool sample, yeah. Not very nice. I wrote, damn, Johan. He came out. Aggressive. (laughs) And uh, then after that scene with Price being like, give my ends on, bitch. We go to Shelly, sleeping peacefully in her abandoned house. And a flashlight coming in through the window. And then immediately, like, the cellar door getting busted open. But Shelly apparently can, like, transport really quickly. And, like, hidden, like, this fridge. Because, like, these people come down into the cellar and are looking around. Like, do you see anyone down there? And they're like, no, it's all clear. But are we not going to talk about how there was basically a bed made on the ground in there? Where they're, like, they could be, like... Last episode, the Shelly and Jason had heard somebody upstairs in the house, and then it just turned out to be a bunch of druggies shooting heroin in the house. So a, like, makeshift bed in a basement of an abandoned um, heroin house would not be weird. That's all. But she hid, and then she comes out of the fridge after they leave and go upstairs, and she's emailing Norman again for help, which is a little concerning that uh, Shelly still has the parent's phone. Yeah, I was confused about that. Like, good for her, because now she sent Norman to help her, but, like, okay. Yep. Um, and then we go, we have a scene, we flash to a skyline, and I wrote, that's the Toronto skyline. Why are we looking at Toronto? And then we immediately got the answer to that. But I was like, okay, I'm not insane. Because sometimes, because they filmed the show in Ontario, like near Toronto, outside of Toronto. Like they didn't film it in Pennsylvania, they filmed it in Canada. So I was like, did they just like royally fuck up and expect us to not recognize the CN Tower? Mm -hmm. Because like, that's not a, I'm from that area thing. That's one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. Yeah. So I was a little, I was like, okay, but don't worry, they were supposed to be in Toronto, um, because that is where the mom and little boy who ran away from Hemlock went to, because her mom lives there, and she went up to stay with her mom in Toronto, and they show her on the phone talking to her friend about getting away. And then she sits down on the couch and it shows the scene that Peter had seen in his dream of the German Shepherd. And I literally wrote, damn it, no. Yep. And then you see that the tub starts to overflow. Like you can see the water coming down the stairwell, but then it cuts away to another scene. Of, well, they, uh, no, it cuts away to Shelly. So this this sandwich is Shelly. So what we just talked about actually happens in the middle of this. Um, and then it cuts back and the water has started to like pour down the stairs. And the mom sees the water finally and goes upstairs and they show her, they don't, thank God, they don't show the kid in the tub. Yeah. They show yeah. the mom like freaking out and looking at the tub and crying. And then the masked dude is behind her. So that scene yeah. is the only time we see cult stuff at all this episode, which was upsetting. But like I said, the episode was so good that I was not as angry as I thought I would have been. Exactly. And then after this scene, um, it goes to Roman outside, not Roman, Peter outside leaving with uh, um, Destiny and uh, and, uh, Andreas. Andreas. And Michael's walking up to him and he informs Peter that, like, hey, like, that boy and that mom, they died in Toronto. He's like, either you're part of an international gang or you actually, and he's like, or what, you actually did buy a unicorn off his orlag or wherever the hell. Yeah, he said, he said the little boy, he said that boy and the mom died. Um, and Peter said, like, how did it happen? And he said, the boy drowned in a bathtub, which Peter said the kid was going to drown. And she said, and he said, and the mom, or she said, she drowned her son in a bathtub and then jumped out a 10-story window. So either your part, and he goes, and I'm guessing there was a German shepherd involved somewhere. So that's his way of saying, you were right, and I was wrong, and I need your help. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we 
After this scene, we have Roman staring at Miranda post-coitus and uh, wants to double munch on her neck, but then uh, she wakes up, tells him to lay off the coffee, and then he should get some rest. Yeah, and she's he's like staring at her, and she's like, okay, you're creeping me out. I gotta go feed the baby. And then she's like, oh my god, I never thought I'd say that. And I was like, this is the weirdest family. Yeah, strange yeah. little, strange little family we got going on there. And then uh, Roman seems to start going into a panic attack. And then we hear, we're at, then we see like the outside of the Godfrey building, and we see a bedroom at Godfrey. And I wrote, wait, our man JP lives at the White Tower? Yep. JP be looking at the White Tower and be waking up looking like Elton John with a sleeping mask on. No, that was, okay, I love me a good sleeping mask. In fact, I need to buy a new one because I had a really nice one and then I, um, it broke and I didn't buy a new one because at the time I was getting eyelash extensions all the time, but my allergies have been so bad that I haven't been getting eyelash extensions, so now I have no reason to not have a sleep mask, so I need a new one. Or you get the one like, yo, you have your eye holes cut out. No, because then that doesn't give me dark i don't i wear it for the dark johan uses it to prevent crow's feet apparently it was one of the puffy face ones yeah it was it was a for sure diva moment and it had like the little beads in it so it looked like i thought it had rhinestones on it and he, he when he hears this pounding at the door he gets up so quick and has like a gun in his hand but, but he looks like oh, he's the mask like he's he's whole he literally looks like the lone ranger for days because he's got a silver gun with a silver rhinestone mask. And, like, I was like, what the? Bryce is having a moment. Um, but it seems like uh, Roman's already in the room and, like, kind of just tossed his price across the floor. And he's like, he goes, whoop, 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 whoop. Like, he's not, he looks like he's, like, a crack addict. Like, he looks like he's, like, actually going. He's like, um, yeah, he keeps saying, Whoop, whoop, whoop. but he's not saying you're saying it like in a weird tone of voice he's mimicking the sound of the blood in their neck that's what the whoop is for him he's he he just and that's all he hears all the time and he's like they don't get to die so that i can live like this i don't want to do this anymore i don't want to hear it anymore i want like he's like trying and he's crying and he freaks out and i just wrote poor roman like he has snapped and he like gives hey, hey, hey. anything, just anything to stop. And yeah. I'm like, oh. which I didn't like the way he kept repeating it, but I also because so like personally I didn't like it, but also like I said, I I knew what he was saying, I understood it, I get it, I just don't like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Ron um, Price is like, it's okay, like you're home now, you're safe now, I will take care of you. And is like patting his head while he's crying. And he had just like a look on his face of a more genuine response than I've seen from him. And between all the knowledge of Upiers and how angry he was about getting this enzyme finished and seeing Roman lose control, like that's why I'm starting to think maybe he is more good than bad. Yeah. 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 Let's hope it stays that way. Well, uh, ho let's hope that whatever, because Dr. Chernobyl is still claiming that whatever this enzyme is, it's going to kill its host. But obviously, mm, Price knows more about Upir than, like, Chernobyl doesn't know shit about it, obviously. And so let's hope that he's not doing it with the intent to kill the host and he actually understands the science enough to say that this will help if that makes sense yeah because yeah. like my own is that i think he wants it for its intention of killing the host because from how lot it's like they want the godfrey's out of the white tower well roma just gave it to christ he said you can take my car take my house take the tower take godfrey i don't care take everything Let's get this as well. So that is um, the end of the episode, the funniest episode so far. Um, is there anybody uh, you want to punch? Uh, anybody?
anyone who directed or written any episode before this one because goddamn. Um, I think I want to punch Miranda. The thing is, I didn't, I didn't hate Miranda because Miranda was actually, like, she had also, once again, like, a personality this episode compared yeah, to Yeah, but I still want to punch her for sleeping with Roman, like, two weeks after she slept with Peter. That's fair. That's pretty fair. No, I'll join you in on that punch. I, I re- I'm kind of stuck on my saving grace, honestly. I'm literally stuck between Johan and Roman. Me too. Because Roman was so honest in this episode in a way he hasn't been. And Johan, we're starting to see more of his real intention. But also, Olivia was funny as shit this episode. It's real hard. I'm going to give them a gold, a silver medal, and a bronze medal. And they can fight over who gets what. They all get a good star on the good noodle board. I think it's fair. We should have been doing that. We should have seen whoever gets the most stars on their good noodle board by the end of the show is truly the best character. Well, when we do our um, Hemlock Grove wrap up, we can uh, go back and tally who got it for every episode. Okay. And then um, see who is the uh, the winner. The winner. Yeah, yeah. Good noodle prize. The good noodle prize. It's a SpongeBob reference, Mary Kate. I'm 28 years old. I don't watch SpongeBob. That's sad. I literally got CBS All Access just to watch SpongeBob, and I'm 20. Um, actually, let's not kid anyone. Um, I I don't watch SpongeBob, but I um do often sing SpongeBob the Musical very obnoxiously at my students. So I can say at your yeah. Oh no, I don't sing to them. I sing at them. <laughs> Welcome um, today. For my favorite pet snail. I hope you guys all enjoy. This is I am ready is about to set sail. <laughs> this kind of day couldn't get more perfect, but it keeps on trying. Somewhere out there, there's a Krabby Patty that needs frying. So, um, basically, this week, this is her second musical rendition of a song today. You know, you're just jealous. I am, because you have a glass of wine and I don't. And also because it's nighttime and it's now 11 o'clock in the morning for me. Um, I'm jealous that you're wearing a hoodie because I'm sweating my tits off right now. It's so comfortable here. Like, it's not too cold. It's not too hot. I got blanket on, hoodie on. I can't, I can't use my air conditioner during the freaking podcast because it's either too loud or too cold, and it's just the devil. Devil. Well, this was a fun episode. I enjoyed it. It was a good week's episode. I hope it was a good listen for you guys as well. Um, comment below with your rank of the 15 hottest guys in Twilight. Um, yeah. Charlie Swan is dad. Julian Solomita as Charlie Swan is dad. Is dad. That was that was nice. That was nice. <laughs> um, I should tag him in this video just for that comment. Yeah, just yeah. for that comment. Julian Sulamita, we talk about you for 1.1 second in the podcast this week. Please listen to the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Death and Aliens. Send us email, deathandaliens at gmail.com. Uh, follow me uh, at... E-M-K-A-Y underscore superstar because I am one. 
and you can follow me on Twitter at mon underscore Lynn underscore and at Monica dot Lynn underscore on Instagram as well. And um, with that, we will talk to you next week. Next week. Bye.